Hi, and welcome to Sacred Spaces. My name's Michaela Drebeck, and today we're at the Abbotsford Convent, which is just a stone's throw away from the Melbourne CBD, but you'd never know it by the surroundings and the serenity that, that is the Abbotsford Convent. It's steeped in history, known to be around from about 1838, but home to the people of the Kulin Nation and the Wurundjeri and a, and a very special meeting place um, well before it was inhabited by the people that use it here today. It's been a convent that housed over a thousand women. It's been a university and now it's a hub of creativity. There's so many things to see. We're really excited to show it to you today because it's extra special because it's our hundredth episode. And we have an extra special guest that's gonna talk us through the history and what is Abbotsford Convent today. Hi, and welcome to Sacred Spaces. My name's Michaela Dreberg, and today we're celebrating our 100th episode. And to do that, we've gone to an extra sacred space, the Abbotsford Convent. We've also got a very special guest interviewer with us, as well as someone else that's as just as special. So let me introduce Richard Wynne, who's our Planning Minister for Victoria, but also the local state member for Richmond. And we've also got Maggie Maguire, who's the CEO of the Abbotsford Convent Foundation. Welcome. So, Minister, you've been involved with this space for a very, very long time. Uh, what's so special about this space for you? Well, it's a very unique space because we are really only a couple of kilometres from the CBD of Melbourne. And as we'll see uh, through the show today, this is just a magical place because the rich history of the Abbotsford Convent itself, and of course the Collingwood Children's Farm as well, uh, is something that is very, very unique to Melbourne. And this particular uh, convent foundation, I think is unique in Australia as a place uh, where the aspirations of the community who fought for this place to be kept in public hands has been realised as uh, an arts, a cultural and an educational precinct that is enjoyed by literally tens of thousands of people uh, every day. And there's many people around today, which surprises me because it's actually a Tuesday morning that we're filming this as well. Indeed, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful Tuesday morning and we're here in the courtyard of the convent itself, uh, such an historic building uh, that uh, uh, lend, lends itself to the, the sorts of uses that we've got here. So the convent building here is uh, really, I'd categorise as being like a wellness centre, isn't it, Maggie? Yeah, wellbeing's an important yep. part of it. Yep. So we've got wellbeing practitioners. Uh, a lot of the ex-sisters cells now house artists, all types of artists, small to medium organisations, uh, social enterprises, yep. a whole mix of people working here every day. We've got over 120 leases currently, which represents about probably four or 500 people who come here daily. And the focus is very much on creativity at this point in time, but you've both touched on the history. It's gone through a few different iterations over centuries. So first from the 1800s, uh, where it was a meeting place for uh, traditional custodians of the land that we're now meeting. So can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, it's very, imp very, very important uh, that this site was, of course, a meeting place for uh, the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong people are also... Uh, have, have association here as well. And indeed the Wurundjeri people are actually are headquartered here. So there is an opportunity for people to uh, meet and talk to elders of the Wurundjeri. Uh, and because we are uh, in such an important bend in the river here of the Yarra, uh, there are many uh, extant uh, sites here that are very, very important to uh, Aboriginal people and their culture. So that history is here today and alive and well and that that, that rich uh, uh, cultural diversity that is so much a part of this part of Melbourne uh, uh, cannot be, I think, better described than what you have here at the convent itself. And, and that, I mean, to touch on that history is amazing to know that it's here today as well. And the combination with it being a convent, and it was a convent for many, many years as well. Uh, so it was again in the 1800s when it was first um, purchased by two sisters, is that correct? Uh, so it was four, uh, 1860, 1864. Yes. Uh, the four nuns came out from Ireland, the Sisters of the Good Shepherd, uh, and 
uh, very courageous women. I mean, to to come all the way from Ireland to uh, to establish uh, to establish this uh, facility here is 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 an amazing and, and courageous thing. But that's not to say, as Maggie will talk about, there there over that journey, uh, the the sisters uh, also uh, had to deal with a, a lot of. Um, uh, some darkness, I, I think it would be fair to say, Maggie. Yeah, it would be. Mm. Um, the sisters' agenda was to look after wayward and fallen women, which is why they were actually invited to Melbourne. So during the gold rush, there were a lot of families that disintegrated, women who were in trouble, who needed help and support, and the sisters' main job was, was to do that. So over the century that they were here, they literally bought the entire peninsula and built different buildings for different purposes. Mm. Um, and one of the unique aspects of this site is that there's nothing else like this in Australia where you've got so much of the original built form literally still standing. Um, obviously, we've turned it upside down a bit now and we're doing different things with the, with the buildings and retrofitting them for contemporary use. But the sisters' work at, at its peak probably involved about a 1,000 women and girls living in this, in this site. And, of course, you had the industrial laundries as well that were, that were a part of this. The Magdalene laundries, which operated globally. Um, and so the sisters and the girls did the washing for most of the big hotels and hospitals, uh, for the well-off families up the hill. Um, there was a small ironing room and a large ironing room. So it was a very industrial, busy place. And what's now the Collingwood Children's Farm was where they grew all their food and vegetables. So they were totally self-contained. And when did it become a university? Well, it became a... So the, the nuns moved out of this facility. And, in fact, they were just located literally a, a, few, um, a, a few yards up the, up the street here. But it became a university... It became La Trobe University in the uh, 1980s. So it was uh, a number of faculties of the university were here for a period of time. But ultimately, the university decided that it, they needed to consolidate on one site, um, and that they moved out uh, to their to the main La Trobe uh, campus. And the this is when the real community struggle occurred because the site was then sold um, for a residential housing development, and the local community then really seized on this opportunity and and thought, well, here is a chance for this extraordinary site to be opened up for community use and not just another residential subdivision and uh, obviously um, use of the historic buildings here for a residential private use. And so that campaign was really waged for you know, probably was eight years? Yeah, eight years, yeah. And it was around 2004 that it was officially handed over by the then Brax government? Yes. I mean, it was a cause of extraordinary celebration because it, it was a hard fight because, because the site had been sold. I mean, it had been contracted uh, and uh, it was a big thing for a government to say, well, uh, we would actually like to turn this around and have this, uh, this uh, extraordinary precinct held in public ownership again. But we did it. Uh, and it was done on the basis, really, of, I think, a recognition that, uh, that the aspirations that the community had for this area were not only legitimate, but they could, in fact, be realised. So uh, we did hand the site over in 2004, and it was, it was a wonderful day because it, it was a culmination, as Maggie said, of extraordinary effort by the community to, to campaign. Uh, Obviously, to uh, ensure that that uh, I, as a local member, uh, represented the views of the community, and uh, and I had to fight pretty hard in government because people are going, "Hang on a minute, what's all this about?" Um, but once you actually took people down here and gave them the opportunity to to see the richness of what was available here, you sold people every time. Um, but I remember, I do remember walking in here on some occasions and thinking, oh my God, how's all this going to work? Because it was completely overgrown. I mean, there were, there were, there were vines all over the place and it was, the place was completely unkempt. Uh, and you had to have a pretty good vision to actually see what this could be now. And yeah, it's, it's, it's to the great credit of the community who fought so hard for this. But I do also have to say to the great credit of... Um, of the Brax government that they were prepared to hand this hand this incredibly important parcel of land back to the uh, back to the Abbotsford Convent uh, Foundation uh, and transfer a title as well. And that's highly unusual. Most unusual. 
unusual, most unusual. What, what happens normally is you might enter into a long-term lease yep. um, with a foundation, perhaps at peppercorn rent, but it was seen by the government as um, really uh, an acknowledgement that you could uh, pass uh, this site into the hands of a foundation who would nurture it, look after it, and continue um, uh, over successive years to uh, refurbish and redevelop the site in a very sensitive way, as we'll see as we walk around. Which I'm dying to do, and I'm really pleased that we've got you here as well, Maggie, to be able to take us on that tour. So, shall we do that? Yes. Okay, good. Well, we've taken a bit of a stroll around the grounds now and we're in a really beautiful green area. Where are we, Minister? Well, we're actually here in the beautiful rolling gardens of the Abbotsford Convent, which, of course, lead down to the Yarra River just, uh, just in front of us. But behind us is really quite an interesting building. So this is actually one of the youngest buildings uh, in this uh, beautiful precinct. It's a 1902 building, so quite late uh, in the development of the, of the whole convent uh, complex. And Maggie's um, going to tell us a little bit about some of the issues she's had to deal with in trying to refurbish buildings like this. Quite a challenge. The baby of the site. <laughs> yeah, well, it's kind of the baby, yeah. Um, this building I always love because, A, she's very big, um, and she's still got some crosses on the top of her, on the roof. When the sisters left the site, they had a massive auction in these gardens and they sold everything, including 36 pianos and all the beds and all the linen and all of the statues. But they left those crosses, and we have a private theory that it was because they were too high and they couldn't <laughs> get them. But originally this building was designed to have four wings and um, the sisters apparently ran out of money. So the fourth wing is now a garden. And I love that because that's the way we run the foundation. We're constantly improvising and making it up as we go to make sure that there's enough money to go around and do everything we need to do. And you have been doing a lot of things around here. So you touched on this before in terms of, you know, being able to retain the history of the buildings, but then also being able to retrofit them as such to be able to meet the needs of today, which is very much about a creative space. Uh, so how do you do that? We talk to Heritage Victoria a lot. They're a real partner in this journey. Um, and obviously the externals of the building are really important because that's what the public see. The way this building was positioned though was clever as well because it was designed so that in the summertime the breeze would come up from the Yarra and so the sisters could open the windows in the bedrooms and then get a, a breeze through. Yeah. Now ironically most of our tenants go home at night in the summer and so we have to shut the windows so the possums don't get in. <laughs> it's a bit back to front. And let's, and let's not forget, we are, what, a couple of kilometres from the middle of Melbourne. Well, it, it, is, it, it is quite extraordinary. It is. You would never, ever think that. It's so still and quiet here. Yeah. And this is quite the, the rolling hill. And Maggie and I are secretly loving it because we feel a little bit tall. Yeah. <laughs> um, do, what, do you, what else happens in this space here? Oh, festivals, weddings, um, events. People come and have their kids' birthday parties. Um, on a weekend, you can have 700 people just hanging out <laughs> here, reading a book. Yeah. It's become a front yard and a backyard for a lot of people, especially in inner Melbourne, because yeah. if you live in an apartment, you don't have a garden. Um, a few months ago, I met a lady at the gate who had a tiny little bub with her, and she said, I just want to come in and put my baby on some grass. Yeah. Oh, That's come on in, you come. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You must hear some fabulous stories about just what this space means to the people that live around here, given that, you know, they are the people that you represent. Do you have any standout stories like that? Well, I think the some of the standouts are that we were able to achieve the, the vision of the community. I mean, it's an amazing thing when a bunch of people get together and they say to government, hey, don't develop this as, a, as a, just another housing development. We can do something exciting and something that's so much better. And to now walk around this precinct, which was completely overgrown. I mean, this all this beautiful... You couldn't this. see any of this. All this garden area was just a complete mess. And to be able to, to say to that community now, well, here it is. Your vision is here. You've got these, these amazing buildings that are opened up, uh, that, are, that are alive, uh, that are really special places where every weekend there is something happening here, which is exciting. This has now become one of the most visited uh, precincts in the whole of Melbourne. It's, it's extraordinary. Like it's 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 way past anything any of us <laughs> could have envisaged. We've gone, well, gee, it'd be great if we could actually get it open, maybe get a couple of buildings renovated. But now to have th have this extraordinary precinct 
having a, one million visitors a year just speaks to what an extraordinary success it's been with more work to do. And that's another area that you want to show me, your next project. Absolutely. Let's go take a look. So we're in another, another part of the site now. What is this area known as? This is Sacred Heart Building and we're in the Sacred Heart Courtyard. And the courtyard is used for many different things and one that I'm a little bit excited about is the outdoor cinema. Well, which is fantastic. Um, and it's an opportunity, uh, particularly in summer, so you can, you can sit out here, watch a film, uh, there's a bar behind. But the really, I think the really exciting thing is, is that this whole precinct is, is up for renovation at the moment, Maggie, yeah? And so another part of the, of the complex is opening up uh, and that I think is really exciting. Do you want to talk about that a bit? Yep, it'll be a massive change. Um, so as you say, currently it's cinema over the summer and slow food market once a month, fill it all up with stalls. We're going to have to change that for a little while while we go into building mode. And there'll be a wonderful range of interesting atelier bespoke shops. So you can come and meet the maker, talk to the maker about whatever it is, whether it's a hand band book or a pair of shoes or right. jewellery, etc. That's on the ground floor. And then the top floor will fill up with a whole lot of people working in contemporary digital.